As humans, we are all defined by several synonyms or words that represent who we are to ourselves and others. Hence, this is for you. Hello, dear humanity. Welcome to Human Thesaurus. I'm your host, slash, Peachy Keen, with Shuronkyo Peacock. If you want this kind of content, subscribe now. Episodes are released weekly. Ben is a lifelong foodie, developing wine drinker and trainee cigar smoker who gets a lot of energy from making human connections and enabling others to achieve their potential. His day job combines this with his other passion, which is talking to people. A whole damn lot, trust me. <laughs> He's currently living in Singapore for 12 years with the rock in his life, and her name is Dilpa, and she's so lovely. They now spend a few months a year in Barcelona. Who doesn't want that? He runs a boutique executive recruitment firm with an awesome team of 100% virtual, even before the pandemic, of 85 people in 18 different countries. He fits this role because he loves the cultures, backgrounds, and learning as he gets every day with such a diverse team and exposure to a variety of industries and companies around the world. In recent years, he has been lucky to invest in various startups plus advice and coaching founders. Investments include an ultramarathon business and mental health awareness. And also he's got access to business focused on Southeast Asia. He is also an active board director for Hope International, a charity supporting the neglected poor. As if he's a ball of energy, so he also is a tennis student, very slowly becoming a more flexible yoga student, and a very stubborn ultra marathon shuffler. So I met Ben through my husband's friends here in Singapore, probably, let's say over a decade ago, but we weren't really close enough, but it's a very fun group. We always mix around, we dance a lot. And what I love about this group is that the closeness comes naturally because you travel with them. This group is very organized. They would organize a trip eight months, nine months, a year before, and all of us will show up when we can. Ben is part of this. And all the more that we travel together, all the more that I've come to know Ben, and also uh, his beautiful wife, Dolpa, we just hit it off. Naturally, we both love dancing. We both love just huge laughters and no nonsense, a lot of sarcasm, and really nobody gets offended, which I love. So we have the same humor. And I really just appreciate this guy, especially we, we're just getting closer and closer now that we're back in Singapore. So I appreciate all of that. My synonyms for Ben are Yoki. As a noun, teeming as a verb, and auriferous as an adjective. Within this conversation, you'll further understand why I describe him as such. So here he is, Ben Davis. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben. Same as the words water as a noun, laugh as a verb, and driven as an adjective. I like the word onomatopoeia and I dislike the word hate that best describes you I really really like those would you like to know what you're what I describe you as a noun I would I would please <laughs> so yoki because I was like it took me like a few a couple of weeks to be honest with you to to find the right one for you I have a lot of different angles to describe you but Yoki is the energy from Dragon Ball Z. It's like an equivalent to Hadouken in Street Fighter with Ryu. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember you're... that well. <laughs> <laughs> it's Yoki. So that's the sim simple energy from Dragon Ball Z. So there are different levels to that too. As you go along, each, each character in Dragon Ball Z would have different kind of levels of Yoki. That's so cool. That's so much cooler. <laughs> that's so much cooler than me, Wish. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
But <laughs> of course, you see yourself differently than how others perceive you. Very cool. Do you believe in that? I do. I do. And uh, it's just very, very complimentary of the uh, of the organization of the group as well. I have to be honest, that is never a lot to do with me. <laughs> That's often to do with Silva uh, or Todd or other people. But I like the fact I'm being credited in the collective. Uh, and yeah, really pleased to to have a new word to add to my repertoire. You were going to tell me the definitions of the other. Well, what was the other two words that you mentioned? Sure. Teeming. T-E-E-M-I-N-G. So it's like to be full of something because you're always full of something. It's not full of something negative, but for me, it's full of positive. Sometimes it's as simple as teeming like heaps of tea in a glass or in a teacup. So it's teeming. So you're always full of energy, full of laughter, full of compassion, full of, you know, so you're teeming for me. So it's a perfect verb for you the way I see you. You get it? I do. And I also like that as well. <laughs> uh, I would probably say uh, say that sometimes I can get a little overexcited and maybe overly teamed. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I like the idea of bringing a bit more positive energy and yeah, just trying to give people always have a positive exchange. Uh, so that's what I what I often think about. Absolutely. And the the last one, my adjective is auriferous. It's a very old word. You're going to need to give me the definition. <laughs> <laughs> so auriferous is coming from the Latin, well, is it the Latin word um, of gold? AU mm. is gold, right? As an element. So auriferous is something that's containing gold. So for me, I, I characterize you as having a very good heart and everybody adores you that way. So that's my adjective because really it, it's every single guest that I have, it's taking me a long time because I do take this seriously, how I describe people, especially nowadays, because when I was younger, I'm silently judgmental of everyone. <laughs> I'm very critical of people. I'm very picky. So I have social friends, but I have like close friends and being away from Singapore for five years and having such a bad experience there professionally. When I came back, I've come to appreciate more of what we had here, which is longer term friendships. When I describe people, that's why this show is very important to me because it's also highlighting and appreciating my guests the way I see them. Well, I feel very honored to have uh, such thought put into those words and uh thank you i re really like them well it's you so thank you <laughs> <laughs> i would like to know how are you guys doing in barcelona and how do you get so much energy or or even how do you divide your life between two countries how hard or easy would that be yeah it's good to be here now after two nearly two years of being in singapore due to the lockdown and travel restrictions and it's it's just like picking up a really lovely old pair of shoes <laughs> that you've worn in <laughs> i think coming back here yeah. we we know the restaurants we have you know some beautiful friends mm. again we're blessed to have a great climate here uh, as well as in singapore so yeah it's it's been really easy i think our our kind of it resonates what you're saying about long-term friends as well because singapore for us is is home mm -hmm. and when we come to Barcelona it's just a great you know break but then we're also close to the family in the UK so it's been good and I think the uh yeah we, we've just been so lucky to have really good friends who have you know commonality both in Singapore and in, and in Barcelona and funnily enough we've had some that have visited us in each place mm -hmm. so I think this you know now we can travel and it's not as difficult planes are a bit like buses again then uh, in part sometimes they're delayed or cancelled then we we have um, yeah the opportunity to to explore and it's been really good so far this uh, this summer oh, that's great how do you strike that balance between uh, merry making and work how do you do that since it's 100% virtual as well for you H how can you strike that balance i think it, it it's interesting because the business, the, the core business, you know, headhunting, uh, recruitment, as long as you have a phone 
a laptop, you know, you can be you can be really effective. Mm. And it does come down to I think over the years I've probably balanced work and life to a point where it sort of interchanges. Mm. I'm not someone who works on a weekend, for example. Mm. Uh, I'm not someone that would expect others to. But it, it takes a bit of practice, you know, a few failures over the years, mm. a few burnout moments, and it's not always easy. I'm very lucky that, that Dilpa understands that if we're traveling or we're in a location that's off a time zone, might have to do a very early call or a very late call. And I think, you know, having that other person, having a partner in crime, mm. understand that's been super important. I, I don't think I could have it any other way now. Yeah. I just enjoy the, the, flexibi- the flexibility and the efficiency. And now so many other people in the last few years have gone into that world yeah. of, of working from home, working virtually. And I think that's the thing I constantly hear, you know, wow, I can be really efficient. I don't have a commute. I can kind of put a lot of my life around my work or work around life. So it doesn't always work. Mm. <laughs> There's a few moments I'll be at an airport or I'll be hanging outside a window or I've met friends for dinner and I've got to go outside on a, <laughs> on a call and they say, what are you doing? <laughs> it's 11 p.m. What, why, why are you outside? Why are you working? Well, it's dinner you know, time. That's the balance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the balance. Uh, but I am wearing shorts and a t-shirt and I am in Barcelona. So there is a, there's a balance to it all. Mm. What was the breaking point for you to, to say, oh, I'm not going to work every weekends anymore or we were really burnt out? What was that incident? Is that one incident or just a multiple one? Uh, I don't think it was ever an incident. I think over the years particularly being in a sales environment, in a revenue generating environment, mm. kind of feels like an ultra marathon or a marathon. You kind of have to manage your energy levels and some days you just get out of balance or you have a you know, three or four months where you've really been intense mm. and then you need to take a break. Yeah. And my, my trick is usually when small things, insignificant things feel really, really important and, and create that reaction, then I know that something's probably been wound up a little bit too much in me because I'm a fairly patient person or, or try to be. Mm. So then I think it's just having the awareness to say, hey, I need to take a break. I need to go offline. I need to go have some some holiday or I need to rebalance diet, exercise. But it's sort of like until it happens, you, you, you don't know. Mm. But yeah, again, I, I think the self-awareness only comes from a few derailed derailed moments and thinking wow why am I so angry about that Mm -hmm. actually that's that's not really the true person so it takes a bit of time to to be honest right are we really getting older (laughs) (laughs) well I don't know which does does the does the same things annoy me now as my 25 year old self uh Sorry, All right. But <laughs> it just feels like there's more things flying around. I feel much more aware. Whereas I think the beauty of being younger, I, I really don't think I had as much awareness. I don't know what you think, but it, it just felt like I just was worried about what was in front of me mm. rather than thinking about thinking about anything else. Uh, maybe that was just me. But <laughs> yeah, as you get older, everything seems to be, oh, I need to worry about everything. Right. But uh is it for you? No. Uh, well, for you, I think it's innocence and bliss. But I think <laughs> I went, I still went into the adult world, like real world, first job at 21 onwards. I was very naive and gullible, but I am a highly ambitious woman. And I have a lot of responsibilities at home. So being Filipino, it's a different set of rules, unspoken responsibilities like okay you got educated therefore you need to give back or help someone help your brothers and sisters help your parents whatever like support your family and it rested on me because my siblings were not so useful in that sense so everything rested on me so I've got a massive responsibility the f- for, from the first paycheck that I had but I had fun I had so so much fun in my 20s so like striking that balance between you know your responsibility and also kind of finding a way for you to also enjoy your 20s because I've seen a lot of people who slaved away helping their families and forgotten about themselves and then one day they wake up they're 60 and they did not enjoy their life lives so I don't want that so I always have vision 
Um, I just follow through. In my 20s, I really get frustrated when my plans um, deviate somewhere else because that's what I don't understand. As you get older, you're beginning to understand that, oh, plans are made to be broken. It's there to guide you, to really drive you to go somewhere. And then eventually, if the plans change, then you adapt and then you learn something new. So that's that's where I was in my 20s. <laughs> At least you had a better life than me, I think. <laughs> I yeah, I I definitely um I definitely think there's uh it's amazing because no, you know, knowing you for so long, I think it's amazing the resilience and as you say, you know, everyone has their own story, but I've always been super impressed, you know, and and kind of in awe of it of 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 what you have achieved and as you say the responsibility that you had because I definitely didn't have that kind of um that kind of responsibility so yeah hats off to you for sure oh, you're a, you're a tough one crying. I know you're a tough one <laughs> <laughs> I have to be but I'm really proud that I have to toughen up you know I think this is the another thing about let's we're already talking about diff, our, our different ages and lives um I think at some point in our lives, it really depends on, it, it doesn't matter what age it is. At some point, we parent ourselves and then we choose. So I always believe that, okay, our parents will always try hard to imbibe values or what to do. Don't eat that crayon. Don't eat your poop and all of these things, right? And then when you're an adult or somewhat adulting at, at some point, you choose what values, ethics, lessons that you've learned from your parents and from your friends that you're going to take along with you. Do you believe that? Yeah, I do. I do. I think, uh, I think often about, you know, what, what journey the person has been on, you know, when you meet somebody new mm -hmm. and, or, you know, you, you do business or you, I don't know, you connect with somebody. Everybody's got so many different inputs that they've had it's just fascinating to try and understand that. But then sometimes it's almost impossible because you know, you don't know whether that parental input actually pushed the person in the other direction mm. <laughs> or whether that group of friends, you know, kind of pulled them along mm. and that, that sort of impact and influence is, is, is really interesting. I mean, personally, yeah, I was, my parents were phenomenal. I mean, I think they, they, they were quite funny. I think they just wanted me to be yeah. happy. You know, they, 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 they were not <laughs> kind of saying, you must be a doctor, you must make lo lots of money or anything like that. They just said, are you happy? And, oh. and, and, you know, they weren't naive, but they, yeah, they, they just said, are you enjoying what you're doing? You know, are you healthy? Did, you know, can mm -hmm. we do anything? And then I look at other people's, uh, you know, parents and they would be like, wow, you need to like achieve, you need to do this. Yeah. And I think in a funny way, it made me as competitive as I would have been but maybe more, I'm not sure, but they were just so, such a loving upbringing. Um, mm. Yeah, it was really positive. Yeah, that's the thing. It will always either go either way with every single individual. You know, you can be a spoiled brat and annoying and a loser who lives in the basement still asking for mom for dinner and stuff, but you didn't. You've been competitive. You know, you chose to be competitive and be great, have your own ambitions and stuff. In leading to that, you're always a fun, jolly guy. But we know that life isn't perfect and we can't always be in a joyous state. So what's the other side of Ben that I don't know yet? <laughs> uh, good, good question, Wish. I feel like I should... <laughs> defer to uh my wife but um yeah i think it is funny probably the side that has come up out with friends sometimes and they always look at me in a funny way mm. is a, is an impatience i am quite impatient and i think sticking to task getting things done it, you know i'm probably more a get it done get the outcome mm. and i think when you're on a trip with friends or you're on a holiday or something like that it very rarely pops up mm. uh i think in work sometimes but again i think there's an urgency which is which is quite good 
So yeah, that that side of impatience, um, I don't think you've seen yet. No. I'm sure you will see it. <laughs> it comes out sometimes, <laughs> but uh, I, I just I just like things getting done quickly. But when you're impatient, how do you act it out? Uh, Are you irate? Like you roll your yeah. eyes? Like how? Yeah, I think there's a <laughs> there's an element of uh, you know the sort of passive aggression that is maybe it's quite british as well you know you've heard this expression you know there's some great trigger words you know oh that's interesting oh that's loaded yeah that's that's <laughs> not so sure about that <laughs> i'm generalizing a lot you know i think that probably comes through but never always try and treat people the way i'd want to be treated it is i'd, I'd say quite quite gentle quite british i'd probably become overly polite overly helpful mm. to try and help the situation along but um yeah i definitely like <laughs> things to be to be done right wow because i'm normally more straightforward i i, I can't be british uh, most of the time it's like you hand me that thing bitch you know it's not <laughs> i'm not as nice as you i think <laughs> <laughs> there's the inner voice and there's the outer voice. I think this is the this is the constant back and forward. My inner voice is is possibly more like your inner voice, but uh, then it then it manifests in a way that I know my you know if my parents were listening to me, they would feel proud that I had treated people in. <laughs> in a nice way so that's still i still have in my mind you know how you behave to people that it could be put onto a onto a netflix series and then see a video of the way you're <laughs> behaving to a waiter or a waitress or a traffic warden or someone and was I, am i actually proud of the way i was in that scenario mm. it's a bit like the truman show or something like that <laughs> I, i i still think about that and i don't know whether that's british or whether that's just a a way of trying to behave mm. but that's definitely what my parents instilled in me for, for sure yeah it's your value it's something that's really your value that you've chosen as well which is fantastic that goes in different ways too because i could be a big ass bitch boss at work but i have more patience with people personally when it comes to servers right the people that serve us waiters and all of that i show as much compassion and respect because uh, what they're doing is hard i always give that respect to to service people they need to be appreciated more by the society and they're not really getting that a lot and even some of them may be a little bit annoying especially in the F&B world, you still have to be kind of nice. It's consistency as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's when I listen to, you know, people write and talk about, you know, whether you're in your personal life or in the work life, I know it's not always possible to be completely the same. Yeah. In scenarios, we need to sometimes, well, we need to adapt. Yes. But I think I'd be very lucky and to be able to be pretty much myself mm. whilst also working within the structure so that people don't feel uncomfortable you're not overly familiar in certain environments you're not overly mm -hmm. um, formal in other environments that that is something that again yeah I've taken from my upbringing and I've taken from my friends mm -hmm. and I feel really lucky that that I can for the majority of the time be that way mm -hmm. yeah which is kind of cool I think of you like that as well as being pretty consistent honest direct as you say you kind of call a Call it what it is. Yeah, that's that's good as well. It's it's not like I'm I am concealing myself. I'm still being myself at work. It's just that I'm more assertive. Like I'm larger than life, but it's still me. Let me say that my alter ego is Cookie Monster. That's my alter ego. <laughs> so I just add Cookie Monster to the flavors that I have at work, but it's still me. It's just that as a petite Asian woman who wanted to, who's working globally, then you've got to be fierce enough to really voice out everything and not let anyone walk all over you. From the beginning, I've been, yeah, I was gullible and naive, and that's the lesson that I've learned. So for me to excel and really reach my ambitions, I have to step it up and bring the cookie monster out in the wild at work.
Who's your alter ego? <laughs> Gosh, I was thinking the Cookie Monster is a uh, is a fantastic alter ego. I'm not sure how I would how I would beat that, but it, it did make me think about a conversation I was having recently around you know that gap between what you think is right and the data and the confidence that you have to kind of go with it and whether that gut instinct so i think maybe my alter ego is is some kind of positive <laughs> positive mental attitude glass half full uh, character who we might be 51 percent confident in a decision or something we're going to do but hey if we go into it positively and confidently then i reckon we could make up the ground and not to say i'm into wishing for things to happen uh i think you've got to work really hard but i do think that that's quite important to yeah to sort of positively vision and positively think about things because then then you don't leave anything on the field you know you don't leave anything behind mm. you can then look back even if it doesn't work say well i went into it 110 percent, even if it doesn't work out <laughs> which sometimes that, <laughs> that's what happens at least you've gone into it positively yeah with all of these inputs all of these wisdom that you're sharing with me do you think that the culmination of all of these that made you decide to become an ultra marathon guy how do you call it ultra marathoner absolutely not i'll tell you who's responsible <laughs> for that it is a, a very dear friend of mine, Matt Chapman, who you know, oh. who, who, who is, you know, he, he has been a, a mentor and a friend. We've worked together mm. for many, many years. And I remember when we moved to Singapore, I'd actually met Matt 20 plus years ago when I was first yeah. in Singapore. Then when we came back, he said, hey, I'm going to do this ultra marathon <laughs> in Mongolia. It's a hundred oh, kilometers. Wow. It's called sunrise to sunset. And it just, mm. you know, he'd done a few of these things before and he said, you can come, Dilpa can come. We stay in yurts. It's in the middle of nowhere. Oh. It's next to <laughs> Lake Hovsgol, which is the deepest lake in the world. You take a couple of plane rides in Mongolia, then you take a bus. And anyway, it was in the middle of us. Wow, this sounds amazing, <laughs> but I can't run. I'm not a runner. Uh, I'm an eater. I'm an eater. I'm a wine drinker. Uh, I used to play rugby and football, but yeah, look, you know, and he said, don't worry, we'll do the training together. So we started doing some of the training and then, and then basically, yeah, then the rest was history. Uh, and, and from there, I think the mental switch off of the ultra marathons has always appealed to me more than the actual, you know, I still can't run, I shuffle, I'm terrible. But having five days in the middle of nowhere with no email, no phone, uh, you have to make some decisions around your health, well-being. You're in the middle of nowhere. You're responsible for yourself, which yeah. in this time, very rare for you to really have to worry about your own sort of physical well-being in, in a way mm. you're always amongst people you're always within reach of a hospital you know you can always get water you can always get food so that has, was just amazing and I haven't wow. done any for the last few years but I did love the I did love the experience I remember a foot problem or a sock problem was that you I, I kind of <laughs> barely remember the some of the stories when you both came back I did. I did. Was that like, yeah, I got. I got. You a, had a toe problem. What was it? <laughs> yeah, I might. I might have accidentally had one size too small on my trainers for one of oh. the ultra marathons in Chile. Um, now it wasn't so small that I couldn't wear the trainer, but when you are in the desert, so this was in the Atacama Desert, mm. it's so hot oh. that your feet expand, so you need room right. to not then get blisters. Didn't really think about that. I forgot. I then got the wrong size and then I oh. got blisters. They got infected. And on the last day, I actually had to withdraw because I was pretty delirious. Oh my and I, it turned out I had an infection in my foot. And fortunately, there's medical staff there. But yeah, that was a good lesson. Mm -hmm. Always triple check your kit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and bad preparation definitely causes a problem. But I, this was the fifth day. I'd already done 200 kilometers. Oh so at least I'd done most of it. But I had a pretty good reason not to finish that one. Good learning. Wish. Wow. <laughs> Did you feel bad about not finishing? Because I'm not 
I'm not a runner. I hate running. I hate sweating in that kind of environment. I just like infrared saunas. <laughs> what are the factors that's that drives um, a marathoner or someone who would try to be a marathoner? And when you don't finish, how does it feel? Does it really feel bad? Do you beat yourself up or it's okay? I mean, apart from injury. So interesting. I, I didn't care. <laughs> so my view was I had left it all out on the trail. Mm. You know, I had an injury. You know, I trained for it. I felt good. And it was almost something outside my control. And this is something I think about a lot in life. Yeah. I can only control what I can actually control. It's like an obvious thing, but I never really get annoyed or frustrated with things that are outside of my control. So in that scenario, no, I was fine. I was quite looking forward to a beer and a pizza back in the hotel, to be quite honest. But yes. I think, <laughs> yeah, that was a win for me. But having seen now, and particularly being uh, seen a, a company grow, UltraX, a brilliant business, uh, you know, Sam and Jamie, the founders of, of an ultra racing business in the UK, mm. seeing what they're trying to do around including more people in this crazy world of beautiful places, five days on a trail, both financially, because, you know, they've made it more cost effective. Mm. We're also seeing the breadth of people, you know, who really want to, yes, they want to finish. Mm -hmm. And some people are runners, true runners. Some people want to become in the top 10. Mm. But what I found really powerful on these is the camaraderie, is the feeling of achievement. Yeah, No one cares how long it took you. It's just being out there yeah. and achieving something uh, that's really, really cool. So, yeah, there's people that just you know, shuffle, walk, uh, mm. and that's been amazing to, to see. Wow. Sounds wonderful. I still won't do it. <laughs> Why not? It's really not something that I'm into is all. And it's got to be something you really want to do because yeah. <laughs> when you're out there and the training, I mean, the training as well. I mean, yeah. Anyway, maybe leave that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that one. So as adventurous you are with life, is the Ben that I know now is the same as when he was a kid? I think, cool. okay. I think so. I think I worry more now. Mm. And like I said, I think when you're younger, you don't know the repercussions. You know, you don't think about mortality. You don't think about retirement. And I'm not saying that I want to retire, but mm. you, you just don't have those on your mind. Mm. And I think I probably was yeah a little bit more lazy <laughs> when i was younger i think uh i think I, don't we all i probably didn't <laughs> yeah we probably i probably didn't realize although i always worked hard i thought i think then mm. as you get older you see people you know you start comparing and you you look and you realize wow that's really hard work that's hustling that's pushing it and then you kind of reset your your boundaries so maybe it's just getting older but i love learning by watching people do something amazing or seeing the way they do it mm. and then sort of picking out things. And, and that, when I was younger, I, I just didn't absorb a lot in terms of education very well. I, 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 classroom based didn't work for me, but mm. when I saw someone do it, I was a good copycat and I would take bits that I liked and then add onto it. So yeah, definitely a, definitely a different, different band to, to childhood Ben. That was an inquisitive Ben then. If you're a copycat or if you're able to copy other people, that's a skill. Yeah. I mean, what, what could I have done if I'd taken a different turn? <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> oh. that's the question. <laughs> well, I thought I was going to be a teacher. I really thought I was going to be a teacher. Oh, really? Yeah. So when I... Really? Yeah, 100%. So when I came out of, well, university, I did a sports science degree mm. and I loved it. You know, we got to teach or coach to our kind of peer group played lots of sport, learn about the science. It was great. Oh, wow. And then I think I really thought I was going to be a teacher and always loved coaching and supporting people. Mm. But then recruitment popped up and then I, I never looked back. <laughs> but yeah, I, I have absolute admiration for teachers, actually, as a result. I, I have so much respect for yeah. what, what they do, whoever the particularly, I think, you know, youngsters who are kind of finding their way in the world at the same time as trying to help educate them, I a lot of friends who are teachers and it just amazes me the patience and the energy and yeah and what they what they do and totally under appreciated in in a lot of ways yeah absolutely i i'm very much the same looking at teachers 
because thinking of a young wish, she's so difficult. I mean, she's <laughs> she's always on, she's mostly on top of the class, but you cannot control her. She's so talkative. So thank you all to all the teachers who can handle very difficult children and honing everybody's minds because no matter how much we hated school or we hated the subjects or we're not interested with a lot of them, when you're an adult, you peg on the knowledge and you're like, oh my gosh, I could still remember that. That was from my third grade. So there's still something that they do. It's magic. So thank you, teachers. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I still remember my English teacher in school, Mr. Smith, and uh, that's why I like the word onomatopoeia. Mm. I remember, you know, I was not good at all at English literature, <laughs> but I loved the stories and the creativity and, you know, imagination that I really, really enjoyed. And he, he brought it he brought it alive. I just don't know how some teachers have the patience. Uh, it's amazing. Right. What did a young wish want to do? I always wanted to be an artist. Always. Uh -huh. Never veered away from it. So if you see, since I was like, what, four or five in preschool, I would always say, it's like, everybody would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would like to take up fine arts. So I took up fine arts. Wow. <laughs> So I have Bachelor of Fine Arts. I always wanted to be an artist. I could express myself. My family is mostly a family of nurses, dentists, engineers. They're mostly science-based. I don't want to be science-based. I don't want to be maths-based. I wanted to include those two, but more in a creative way. So I'm the weirdo of the family. <laughs> My dad told me at a very young age, at some point, you're going to remember this. But when people tell you you're a weirdo, embrace it. It's just that you're different. They don't understand you because you're different. You have to accept who you are. It's like, okay, then. That's why I, I never veered away from everything that I wanted, which is just being an artist. I think that's very wise advice from him. Yes, I miss him very much. Without him telling me all of these little things, yeah, he's right. They tell you those things. You kind of understand them on the surface. And then when you get older and older, that becomes more meaningful, right? Totally. Well, now I hope we're in a, we're in a society or an age now where probably, well, I hope so, it's less for youngsters to feel that. And there's more appreciation for people who think differently. That's certainly what I think anyway. Yeah, as, a, as an optimist, yes, that's, we're getting there. But in any progress that we make, there's always a backlash. Mm -hmm. It really depends on half full, half empty situation, right? I think it's just important for us to be always hopeful. And speaking of hopeful, you are helping Hope International. There are so many charities in this world. How did you get involved with this particular one, Hope International? Yeah, so actually it was through a colleague, Neil, who was involved with a charity through Japan. Mm -hmm. So they have a pretty pretty strong foundation there and for a number of years they'd raised money he then introduced me to to the folks at hope and then we were lucky enough to go to cambodia mm. some uh, some friends actually ran in the half marathon and then we went out to some of the projects that hope had been supporting mm -hmm. to effectively create what i call practical solutions to problems so for example freshwater wells mm. creating them in an areas where you know a handful of families are quite remote that is a critical part of for them to be able to farm yeah. and subsequently become more independent giving micro loans particularly to women mm. to be able to start businesses and also things like buying a cow for a family wow. you know that's uh, you know more powerful than money or anything else so so these these sorts of things which really resonated with with Dilpa and I because mm. we do feel like it's about being practical and not trendy or too over sophisticated it's about doing things that people really need so I like the way that there's a combination of social work in it so the charity mm. actually had full-time employees in Cambodia going and assessing who would be best to put the well in the community of looking at the families, talking to the families, working out who would most benefit, who would be responsible, who would be a good role model. So it wasn't just money directly mm. given to people who asked for it. And that, again, really appealed to me and felt like 
almost having my mum or, you know, dad or, you know, someone that I knew support in the community. So yeah, it's been a great journey and continue to to raise money and create awareness for the for the charity. That's wonderful. It's like teaching people how to fish, not just giving them the fish. 150%. I, I think it also, us being in Singapore, and I don't know whether you feel this, but it is a bit of a bubble sometimes. It and is. There's certainly, well, there's plenty of people in Singapore that also need help. But I think being able to do something in Southeast Asia, which is our home, mm. really was important to us as well. Well, thank you for that charity because, yes, um, Southeast Asia or Asia in general really needed it. So every time I, I'm around these places, I don't take it for granted. I'm very thankful. And then when everybody's complaining about the small thing, I just laugh. Because I was like, oh my gosh, that's your problem here. And yeah, just think about and worry about, unfortunately, worry about other places, right? So we just do what we can with whatever we have, really. Yeah, no, no, I was going to say definitely. No, I agree. I was just thinking it, 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 is, it is not sweating the small things when we're super lucky. I mean, I do feel very lucky, particularly in somewhere like Singapore. I think we do have a responsibility to to give back and to try and yeah support uh, support those who aren't as lucky basically. Yes, that's right. I have two other things that questions that are connected. Number one is what's the most difficult challenge you've ever faced so far in your life? Hmm. I think probably it was the the Atacama Desert <laughs> physically. Mm. Yeah, just to to not push beyond a certain point where I was probably going to cause myself a bit of an injury or get into a difficult situation mm. to just say, okay, actually you need to call time here. And I think mentally that I'm quite stubborn and I'm quite, uh, I think <laughs> resilient. So it was, it was <laughs> to, to have that internal decision uh, was, was challenging. I think probably from a work perspective, there's a consistent challenge around repetition. And I think we all probably feel this sometimes in our work mm. that, you know, once you get to a certain experience level, it can be fairly repetitive. Mm. But that's something that in a way I actually also enjoy. And I kind of feel that that challenge sort of drives me on. So I, I always, there was a joke actually on one of the ultra marathons, they called me the diesel engine, <laughs> because mm. I certainly wasn't the fastest. Uh, I wasn't uh, bad for the environment or anything. But I, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I chug along, I think was the description. And mm. and never and never stop, but not necessarily be the fastest. Uh, I'm probably not the efficient now. I think about it in running style, but or <laughs> shuffling style. And uh, that that in in work is is the way I approach it. So I think the challenge is to know to know exactly where your strength is, and also yeah, just to keep going. That that's uh, that's me. I, I I think wonderful, wonderful. But on the flip side, what was the most embarrassing thing you've ever faced? The most embarrassing thing I've ever faced. Super embarrassing. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a particularly. I'm. See, this is a. I think this might be a British thing as well. Mm. I'm. Qu I, I'm quite often self-deprecating. Right. And I don't have a. I mean, not like everyone, you get embarrassed, but I'm pretty good at making fun of myself. <laughs> so. I don't oh, know. you do. You do? So I mean, this is a this is a good this is a good defense mechanism. So that if I have or do get caught in any kind of embarrassing situation, then I can hopefully dodge by making a joke to my of, of myself. So mm. I can't think of anything that's really embarrassing. Ah, there was well, there was one silly story, but I did think that Goa was a lot closer to the UK. So when I was about mm. 18, uh, I booked a, a booked a trip with my friend and I don't think we'd left Europe before. And I was pretty convinced that, well, basically India was about an hour and a half away because <laughs> maybe I thought <laughs> everything was an hour and a half away. Uh, and uh, I remember saying to my mum, oh, uh, you know, I booked a flight to go with my friend Paul to Goa. She said, oh, okay, that's quite a long way. I said, no, it's not that far. 
I think we go in the <laughs> afternoon, we'd, we'd be there, you know, we're there for a week and then we'll come back. <laughs> and unbeknown to me, you know, get, get on the plane, it's just a little bit further. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, <laughs> maybe it's more embarrassing now I've retold that story, but uh, that lived as legend in the Davis household that I wasn't the best at geography. <laughs> I've got much better now. I've got much better now, but 18-year-old Ben <laughs> was not sharp on that. <laughs> Oh my God. Exactly. Has someone ever made you cry? Oh, I think when I've been in love, for oh. sure. I think, well, we all do, you know, I think that, I think when uh, someone made me cry, mm, no, oh. I think more, <laughs> I think as you, as you know, it's unfortunate when people, you know, you, you experience as you get older, you know, people dying and, you know, loss. Mm. I think, you know, that's something that you just haven't experienced, you know, as you yeah. generally, as you're young, you know, for me, I was extremely lucky. Yeah. We, we, I hadn't experienced it. So I think that almost comes as a double whammy, you, you, you know, so I think in terms of emotions, you know, that was, t- I'd lost my father last year and, you know, that was, that was really tough. I'm really, really sorry about that. No, thank you. And I think, you, you know, yeah, but I, I also think how lucky I was to have not had loss as a, a lot of other people have earlier in, mm. in, in my life, you know, in their lives. Yeah. So for that, I'm really super grateful. Yeah, the time we, I had with him and we had with him. Mm. Regarding that, this is a fact. I never reached out to you or whatsoever because nobody told, well, kind of indirectly, um, I was being told not to know about it. Okay, now you know, you don't know about it. So I was like, but I wanted to reach out because I have an idea how it feels like to lose a parent. I was like, how am I going to console him? How am I going to, how am I going to let him know that, you know, I'm here? Like, that I understand? So this entire time, and then the first time I saw you when we're out of like restrictions was at your place. And then I was just like, okay, this is not the right time. And I didn't get a cue from anyone that, okay, you know now, like you're okay to know. So that's why I never reached out. But I always felt bad about that. (laughs) I always felt like a bad friend, but I felt like I wasn't allowed to know. Isn't it strange though? So sorry. Oh, don't say that. I think it's, it's more strange to know these situations that come up. There's no playbook. Yeah. There's no, do you reach out? Do you not reach I mean, again, you know, yeah, I think it's it's hard and everyone's so different that mm. you don't want to assume that, you know, I've had it myself, you know, you don't want to assume anything. But it's, 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 also, it's also difficult to put into words sometimes, just knowing that people, even now you saying that really makes me, you know, grateful because you were thinking about it, you, you, you know, thinking about me. And, and that in itself is... Yeah, I mean that's what friendship is is about. Yeah, uh, and there, you know, there's always times when people people want to talk about things, and yeah, I think it's it's unpredictable. Yeah, and for me, having experienced how to mourn too many times in my life, I don't tell anyone who's grieving what they must feel or just those feel good things like oh they must be in heaven or they're resting in peace it's not like that because so I always tell someone who's grieving it's like you may think that nobody understands you and that's valid I'm just here if you need um, someone to just listen and not say anything and you can grieve however you want nobody would tell you how to nobody so that's what I always say, because we're all different people and we're all going to react to different things all the time differently because we're really, really like special, unique individuals. But yeah, I just wanted to tell you that um, I didn't mean to disclose it here, but I think it was just the right time because you mentioned your dad and I always felt bad about it because I never really mentioned anything to you at all. Like, even like, oh, I'm going to give you a hug. Because of that, I didn't because I thought I wasn't allowed. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying it now. So that's uh, that's the important bit. Okay, at least that's out. I feel better, much better about that, that, you know, that I cared. In closing, what's the word or phrase that you can impart to our listeners and why? Well, I think I'll probably go back to one of the words that I used at the beginning. Mm. And it's probably, for me personally, as you said, I love bringing energy. I love laughter and I love to 
to feel like if there's one thing, you know, it is to try and have as good a life as you can possibly have. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And I think we should, we should always try and be as positive as we possibly can. So at minimum, let's try and have a laugh. Let's try and have laughter in our lives and have people around us that we enjoy. Uh, and hopefully we can bring a bit of light and positivity ourselves. So that's, that's probably, that's my thought for, uh, for the day. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. It's nice to catch up with you, albeit we're so far away from each other. I hope to see you when you get back. Thanks, Wish. See you soon. From this episode, one of the most important words about life is vigor. It is the physical or mental energy and enthusiasm. It's similar to words muscle, liveliness, fervor, zeal, umph, pep, exuberance, zest, elan, and fire. Samuel Ullman, an American businessman, poet, humanitarian, and religious leader, quoted, Youth is not a time of life. It is a state of mind. It is not a matter of rosy cheeks, red lips, and supple knees. It is a matter of the will, quality of the imagination, a vigor of the emotions, it is the freshness of the deep springs of life. End quote. They say we are what we eat. Well, I say we are what we thrive on, be it running an ultra marathon, learning how to crochet, or finding a way to sing in the middle of the Colosseum in Rome, or to just a simple as uh, successfully baking a pavlova without collapsing. The difference of all of these is enthusiasm or vigor that we put into something that we wanted to achieve. No, it doesn't need to be very big. It just needed to be something that you wanted to finish, that you wanted to go on a journey about. And sometimes it's not even about the finish line, right? It's about how you're learning it how you're learning the process, how you're enjoying the process, and all in all, how you're enjoying the life that you're giving yourself. We have choices. Fine, we have limitations too. But it is a matter of how you're going to take it. So as we move on with life, if we have enough vigor, if we have enough passion, you're going to get somewhere that you're going to be happy about. And please, don't neglect yourself in giving that joy inside your heart. Thank you for listening to Human Thesaurus. Please help me rate and subscribe because your support means a great deal. Join me again next week for another episode. And while waiting, why not listen to my past few episodes? You may find one of them absorbing. I'm your host, Wish Rongkiyo Peacock. Have a fantastic day and thanks for listening.